so good evening one and all at the onset i welcome you all in the first session of the first day of atal fdp on power quality disturbances in a smart distribution grid theories concepts and solutions we have with us dr ankush sharma dr sharma is currently working as associate professor in the department of electrical engineering at iit kanpur prior to joining the iit kanpur he was working as assistant professor in the school of electrical sciences in addition to academic experience of around 6 years he has close to 16 years of industry experience primary in the primarily in the power system and the smart grid domain dr sharma obtained his btech in electrical engineering from harvard watara technological institute kanpur mtech and phd from indian institute of technology kanpur he obtained various awards in academic and professional career including fosuco power system award for best phd thesis work he also received various appreciation and accolades during his professional and academic tenure he is a senior member of ieee his research interests are power system state estimation wide area monitoring system it application into power system smart grid and smart city technological development real time simulation energy management system distribution management system so with this brief intro, intro i would like to request dr ankush sharma to start the first session of the first day dr sharma please thank you dr jain uh, let me share my screen yes i hope you can see my screen right right now it is not appearing maybe some slight delay i think okay okay maybe did you see my screen no 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 not yet okay just a minute uh, let me try once again You can see now. Now, now, now it's okay. Okay, okay. So, good evening to all of you. So, in today's session, we will discuss about basics about the smart grid technology and uh, how we will use that technology for smart distribution grid. Then also, we will uh, discuss about the renewable integration, its challenges, and in the last, I'll give you a. an uh, overview about one case study in fact this is our indo us project where we are deploying the smart distribution system with renewables and storage so i'll tell you a brief about uh, that particular uh, pilot project also so let's first start the discussion related to power system automation because power system automation is the most important component Uh, in the smart grid technology because everything we are now planning to automate so we want some minimum human intervention in operation of the power system the reason is that uh, the response of the human being is slow when you compare with the machines so that's why we want to make more automated operations than the manual operation now if you go back to the history of automation you will see that we started automation in early 1900s uh, year 
and in fact by 1920 we were in a position to develop the relay logic because in late 1880s and 90s we saw a big debate on dc versus ac and eventually ac won because of the long distance uh, send power sending because of that lot of ac distribution systems started coming up the major challenge with the distribution systems was that though those were very small but production was the major challenge so that's why we saw the evolution of relay logics in around 1900 to 1920 in fact we talk about supervisory control and data acquisition system but you will be surprised to know that we started working on scada concept in 1920 only although the actual word which is scada supervisory control and data acquisition system emerged in 1960s but some analog controls and uh, the algorithms based on analog computers was developed during that time why it was required because uh, some of the distribution systems were started interconnecting with each other for power transfer so because of the interconnection lot of issues started happening and we wanted to address those challenges and that's why the power system automation was required we do not we didn't we were not having any uh, digital computer at that time so that's why most of the time analog computing machines people used to use then in 1950s we saw the uh, development of economic dispatch and automatic generation control which actually considered as a advent of our energy management system so you can say that economic dispatch was the first application which was utilized in our power systems then if you uh, further go forward you will see that in 1950s uh, in fact if you talk about 1959 we started the use of digital control systems because at that time the computers digital computers were started coming up in the market and we were having now the semiconductor technology available in the market for better computation purpose so you can say that 60s were the time period where we saw, we see the actual evolution of digital control so we started then digital computing and then uh, other software applications development during that period now the problem again came in different form what happened that since the computers were new different vendors used to develop their own operating system and they were kind of tying up the application software with their own operating system and this caused the monopoly of the software solutions what happened because of that so problem happened because if you want to change the application you have to completely replace the operating system and uh, the computer and this was a huge cost involved in uh, in replacement and uh, utilities were struggling because they were kind of uh, not comfortable in replacing the complete system rather than they wanted some evolution of open standard so people thought and then they started coming up with the open standards which actually started in late 90s and after that uh, as you may be knowing that we started the evolution of uh, scada protocols that is ic60870 and different series were there 101 104 protocol for series and parallel communication so for that particular aspect uh, we saw 
the evolution of such kind of protocols. In fact, to some extent, Windows also uh, standardized the operating system and a lot of software application started coming up. From network point of view, if you see that uh, in 1982, we saw the evolution of RS-422 and 485, which was considered as an open network protocol. Now, what used to happen before that? So before that, we generally uh, use telephone wires for the data communication. That's why if you see the uh, name of SCADA protocols, they are called as telecontrol protocol because at that time when the protocols were developed, most of the uh, utilities were having telephone lines for data communication. So that's why those are called as telecontrol protocol. Now, then uh, you see other protocols coming up like DMP3, and uh, we started having the increased data bandwidth and a lot of data we can transfer from field to the SCADA server. Then if you see the computer network evolution, we see that in 1970, uh, this ARPANET was the first network to implement the protocol suit, which later became TCP IP. And uh, by 1900, uh, 1990, we saw the uh, use of TCP IP in a big way. And uh, this ARPANET project was decommissioned because this became commercially available. So Ethernet, which is another protocol for data communication, was developed and standardized in 1983. Then we saw uh, the Unix, TCP IP for Unix in 1989, and then for Windows. IP, IPv6 was developed and proposed in 1998. In fact, first dot com registration happened in 1985. Worldwide web was developed in 1991. And then Wi Fi, which we use most more frequently now, was developed in 1999. So that is IEEE 802.11b was the wireless networking which was introduced in 1999. So you can see that our power system automation was quite ahead of the evolution of information technology. And this actually created problem for power system engineers because most of the things which we developed were not compatible with the latest IT tool. And this happened because of the late evolution of information technology. Then why we are talking about the smart grid? Because a lot of things happened in the past related to the evolution of power system as well as the evolution of information technology. As I discussed, by 1960s, we were having quite matured power system network and we were started uh, using the softwares like SCADA for better monitoring and control of the power system network. And uh, since we reached almost economy of scale and uh, almost by late 1960, most of the population in developed countries had access of electricity. This in fact raised the demand for uh, electricity in different distribution systems. Once you have the sudden jump in the demand, you suffer the power quality and frequent blackouts. So 1970 to 1990 was the period where we saw a lot of blackouts, power cuts, brownouts, and that's why industry demanded higher level of reliability. So this was the initial triggering point, although we were not having sophisticated technology, as I mentioned, that uh, IT was not that mature in 90s. And because of that, we were not having much sophisticated tools for uh, better monitoring and control of the power system network. 
in late 2000 peak load management uh, happened and because of that uh, we saw redundancy in the grid increasing and this resulted in high cost of electricity and if you remember that california crisis this happened because of the increased tariff of electricity so all these uh, cumulative were the precursor to the evolution of smart grid and then uh, we saw in early 21st century that we got better communication and it inform it technologies sophisticated control systems were developed in fact wind power and solar power started coming up in the system and getting integrated in the power system network and then uh, you saw the grid topology being highly distributed by directional power flow and then growing concern of the cyber security because now more and more and more IT infrastructure we were using in the management of energy grid. Then triggering point happened in the black uh, in 2003 when we saw the biggest blackout in US history and this happened on 15th of August 2003. This gave rise to the triggering of uh, the concept called smart grid. So although we were having a lot of challenges in the past, but uh, 2003 US blackout, which was biggest in the history, gave the, the uh, momentum to the evolution of a smart grid. And in 2007, we saw the act in US, which is called Energy Independence and Security Act 2007 which talks about the smart grid and uh, electric vehicle interoperability, a lot of things this particular act talks about, which became the building block of our uh, smart grid technology. Now, let's see the current structure of power system. You know that we have unidirectional power flow, traditionally designed power system with unidirectional power flow where we have generation, transmission, distribution, and then the power goes to consumer premise through meter and then the loads get the power. What changes we see in the power sector? The first and major change is the alternate and renewable energy sources being added into the power system network because we need to address the global warming challenge and uh, if we are not acting upon we will see that by 2050 we will see the rise of 1.5 degree in global temperature so that's why a lot of governments are pushing up the addition of renewable energy sources in the power system network the development and deployment of new electronic devices we are seeing increasingly being deployed in the power system because once you have renewable energy sources, you need power electronic devices to convert DC into AC or AC into DC if you want to store. And then a lot of sensors and information and communication technology is being used. Then off-grid and grid-connected microgrids with renewable sources are coming up, which includes storage as well. So a lot of islanded microgrids and grid connected microgrids are being developed. This helps in making the uh, small section of load self-sufficient, but it, it poses more challenges because the moment you have fault in the system, your islanding operation of the microgrid needs to be addressed properly. Then we are also seeing the integration of electric vehicles and the charging infrastructure it enabled services for maintaining the power system security reliability resiliency and which gives rise to better wide area monitoring of the system adms and other smart grid concepts then because of these you also uh, try to address some other regulatory and market challenges so these are the key 
changes we are seeing right now in our power system network how we monitor the power system right now so whether it is a transmission or distribution system the power is being power flow or injection or voltage or any other electrical parameter which we want to monitor is being monitored through scada system that is supervisory control and data acquisition how it works at the field you need a device called remote terminal unit in some location you will also see that plc is connected plc is nothing but programmable logic controller so what is the role of rtu so in the field we have two major sensors at least for power system network and these are uh, current transformer and potential transformer so you take the measurement for of voltage and current through potential and current transformer then those analog values come to rtu through control wires then it gets digitized using analog to digital converter in rtu then you do initial filtration of the digital data which you have just now captured and then you process that uh, digital information by packing into a particular protocol and then using that protocol you send data to the remote server so what we use for communication the protocol we use for communication is ic 60870-5-104 if you want to go for network communication or if you still have serial data communication you will use 101 now via router the data reaches to scada network here the communication medium can be anything you can use optical fiber you can use uh, maybe gsm gprs or wifi so depending upon how and uh, what is the distance of device from control center you can decide what kind of communication mechanism is required so once you reach at the control center you have control center network which is nothing but a scada network you get the data here and then you give data to application server where lot of applications including scada are running for visualization so this information goes to your hmi station where you see the single line diagram and then the parameters which you have captured from the field you need many to store the data for historical purpose and then if you want to share data to another control center or to the outside world even using firewall you can share data to external network so this is how scada system works in the control center in india as you know that we have various uh, power system sub networks divided in the form of sub local dis uh, load dispatch centers or state load dispatch center or regional load dispatch center and then national load dispatch center so in fact in india we have five regional load dispatch center north south east west and uh, northeast and uh, then every uh, component of the data is consolidated at national load dispatch center every state has state load dispatch center for monitoring of state level data so once you capture the data from rtu or maybe any other intelligent electronic device you share data first to sub ldc if your sldc size is big enough or you can send data directly to sldc generally sub ldc is the set of sub stations where you first uh, consolidate the data and then consolidated amount goes to sldc and then from sldc to rldc and then it reaches to national load dispatch center for complete country view now if you see in each and every data communication 
you are adding some delay at rtu to sub ldc you may add some 10 seconds of delay then sub ldc to sldc again 10 second then rldc and then nldc so if you see in complete chain you kind of delay the measurement reaching to nldc by say 50 seconds to one minute now if you see the operation of the power system system will take only three to four seconds to go from healthy state to collapse state so you generally have very less time window for taking action and that's why we are not having much uh, visualization or real time visualization with the help of SCADA system because the moment you send data from this to NLDC, you have already changed the state of the power system and you are getting the delayed measurement by around 50 seconds or one minute. So the challenges which we right now have in SCADA system is that we have slow data reporting rate, as I mentioned in the last slide. Then if you see that we have centralized architecture, everything from downstream to upstream is being consolidated with the help of centralized architecture. And most of the time we use client server driven architecture for SCADA visualization. It is incapable to handle the large amount of data because SCADA was developed in late 60s where the size of data was very small. In fact, telephone lines were sufficient to handle the data. Now we are having more sophisticated technology, especially the information and communication technology. We have more sophisticated electronic devices where we are exchanging, exchanging the data in large amount. So because of that, the inherent structure of SCADA system is that you cannot handle the large amount of data. Then you see that most of the time you will have SCADA system operator driven because once you see the data on single line diagram, whenever any event happens, operator has to acknowledge that alarm and take action based on that. So most of the time you will see that operator has to be there 24 seven to address any event which is happening in the power system network. So that is another limitation for SCADA system. Security issues are there because uh, when the SCADA system was developed, there was an, even no one mm, was aware that there is something called cyber security because their IT infrastructure was not developed to that level. Now, we have seen the SCADA system developed in silos and IT infrastructure developed in another uh, different isolation. We are seeing a lot of challenges in a SCADA system because it is now vulnerable to cyber attack. We are still using legacy protocol because that is the only answer we have right now. So that's why uh, we need more sophisticated tools and alternate of the SCADA system, which can enable the real time monitoring and control of the power system network. Then data interoperability is another issue because SCADA system is designed for a traditional way of data communication. So new devices find problem in getting integrated with the SCADA system. We also have new technology integration issues. So for example, you may be aware that we have um, phaser measurement units which can scan and measure the data 50 at the rate of 50 frames per second. If you want to integrate PMU with the scatter system, you face a lot of challenges because the data reporting rate of PMU is very fast when you compare with the legacy RTU uh, system. So that's why we have a lot of limitations in terms of new technology integration. 
dynamics you cannot visualize as i mentioned once you get the data at national load dispatch center it's already one minute delayed so dynamic operation or dynamic visualization of the system is not easy in uh, the SCADA system environment is not open because most of the time this SCADA system is supplied by uh, limited vendors so they try to hold the control of uh, the, uh, the SCADA system market and there is very less open source solutions available for SCADA system. They try to monopolize the SCADA uh, solutions in the market. It has limited complexity handling because when you have large data, the SCADA system sometimes hangs and uh, it doesn't have much capability to handle large amount of data and because of that we cannot build any complex data processing algorithm inside the SCADA system or maybe energy management system which sits on top of the SCADA system or distribution management system which also sits on the SCADA system so depending upon what kind of network you have say if you have the distribution network on top of SCADA you will install the distribution management system where you have a lot of software applications like a distribution system state estimation load shedding fault correction or isolation and restoration uh, activities then optimal network reconfiguration crew management all those software applications are built as part of distribution management system but those are having very limited uh, capabilities because you cannot build more complex uh, algorithms in uh, that kind of structure and we do not have the robustness in the uh, SCADA system because of the inherent legacy which we are carrying along with the SCADA system now you might have uh, listened multiple times IT and OT Let's first try to understand what is IT, what is OT, because this will keep on, uh, we will keep on using these terms for uh, other uh, discussions when we will proceed. So basically information technology is nothing but uh, the that set of applications which are mainly used for uh, storing the data processing the data mainly for business or enterprise environment say for example your billing system mis system or dashboard creation erp solution customer relationship management system all those applications are business applications which are built as part of our it infrastructure so if you see information technology, information technology is built as a top-down approach where top management decides that they need some information from uh, the lower functions and uh, then accordingly the various uh, functions are developed and being used in the system. So you can see that the Evolution of IT started in 1970s, late 70s, you see the evolution of local area network. In fact, 1982, 83, you see the evolution of Ethernet. And uh, uh, in fact, World Wide Web started in 1990s, wireless in 2000. And now we are seeing a lot of new technologies like cloud computer, big data, IoT. These all started in just 10 years back so you can see that the information technology domain is very nascent it's uh, new when you compare with the operational technology operational technology if you see is the set of uh, applications which are used for field level operations 
so for example if you are uh, working in a processing plant you need lot of sensors to process the product development or if you are in a chemical plant you need different sensors to assess the uh, the concentration of gas and pressure and so on so once you hit the ground operation using any technology those are clubbed as operational technology operational technology generally use the sensors and limited amount of data for processing or controlling or operating any device or any visualization so operational technology and information technology are entirely opposite operational technology is bottom up approach where you acquire data at the bottom and then you visualize at the upper level while information technology is the business case where uh, someone at the top decides what kind of the data we need to acquire from the different vertical functions which are there in the particular organization so because of these two different directions we see lot of challenges in integration of the information technology and operational technology we also see that the modern operational technology started its evolution in 1950s which you can see that around 20 25 years before the actual evolution of information technology so because of that it's like a parent child relationship ot people Uh, doesn't want IT people to come into their domain, and IT people cannot understand what OT people are doing. So both are being developed in silos, and this created a divergence in the IT and OT technologies. What we need to do now, because we have lot of challenges, and we need to address those challenges when we talk about the smart grid technology. as as i have mentioned that uh, it has developed from top down approach and uh, ot has developed from bottom up approach because of that we see very limited cross domain knowledge as a power system engineer we know the different operational technologies or applications because we are taught in the course like we know what is scada what is uh, state estimation what is uh, your volt war control what is our load shed how it works right how we do the feeder reconfiguration how we do the loss minimization all those things we study because those are mostly related to operation technology but we are not taught the information technology like how the computer network works how operating system interact with the data packets how the different software applications are built which osi layer works for what pur purpose how your ip version 4 ip version 6 work all those things are there in it domain but we are not taught in our uh, regular course curriculum so because of that we have very limited knowledge of information technology and uh, uh, we are not in a position to add more value in terms of it into our Uh, different uh, ot applications and the reason is simple because ot is more proprietary in nature because ot generally is being taught for uh, power system engineers or electrical engineers or chemical engineers but information technology has become more generic everyone uh, at some point of time uh, reads or and tries to understand the information technology so it people are not in a position to understand ot because ot is very niche in nature you cannot teach a computer science engineer about the power system so what is the answer answer is that at least to some extent we have to understand the working of information technology then only you can um, cross that barrier because until unless you understand the information technology you cannot bridge the gap between ot and it 
Why we need? Because once you deploy the operational technology system, say for example, you have developed the outage management system for distribution network. Now this outage information you want to share with your customers. So definitely you need outage management system data to travel to customer relationship management system that is CRM. But OMS is OT application, CRM is IT application. And you do not know how to integrate OT data with IT data. And their problem is happening. We are not in a position to share OT data or in this particular case, OMS data with the CRM data, with the CRM application. So what we do generally, we take the OT data in some intermediate format, say Excel or any other database we port. And then from there, CRM uh, application picks the data. So because of this intermediate layer, we have inherent delay, as uh, we saw in case of SCADA. The same will happen with the ITOT integration. So that's why we need proper integration of both sides of the technologies. Why we are seeing the barrier? Because we have multiple data sources in OT, while in IT we have much structured database and much structured uh, data sources. Tools such as SCADA or distributed control system, they are not ideal for data manipulation. They give data in different format, which IT applications cannot understand easily. In fact, you know the power system is in this domain. You cannot uh, share the knowledge related to power system with the computer engineer. So there is a huge requirement of integrating IT and OT, and this is possible only if we can understand the information technology. So in distribution system, when you want to make the next generation of a smart distribution system, you need to understand the nitty gritties of IT systems because all uh, applications are driven uh, by the IT tools or in fact new devices such as smart meters or phaser measurement units are more uh, considered as an IT devices because they are more structured when you compare with the legacy RTU and other devices. And in fact, when we talk about more real-time visualization and then evolution of smart grid technology, we need our staffs to be trained for IT and OT both. Then if we can understand IT, then we can use uh, more sophisticated tools like big data, cloud, or IoT for real-time visualization, monitoring, and control of the power system. So the need is that you should capture the best practices of both sides so that you can get the best of both worlds. What benefits you are going to do? Since we are integrating IT and OT, you will have better automation, sensing, and visibility. You can deploy the solution to make the visualization or operation in almost real time. You will have more flexibility because you can use more uh, updated or new technologies in the power system network, better compliance with regulatory requirement, improved organizational performance because your delay will be avoided, more effective workforce because you need to keep only one type of workforce, whether it is OT system or IT system. Why you will keep different sets of people for OT, different for IT. So you will optimize the workforce. You can have better decision-making capability, improve customer satisfaction because as I gave you the example, when you are using outage management system, you can immediately integrate with the CM, CRM and CRM tool will send the uh, information in terms of SMS or maybe uh, the net network push about the outage information. So informed customer will be more satisfied. And that's why we'll have the better stakeholder satisfaction. What recent changes we are seeing in the distribution sector, we are seeing that 
there is a large deployment of rooftop solar and uh, ground mounted renew renewable energy sources this is causing uh, another kind of challenge which is in terms of uh, addressing the faults because the traditional power system has more inertia and uh, when you have more solar integration in terms of rooftop or maybe large solar farms your center of inertia reduces and this impacts the uh, fault uh, addressing capability of the system because when you have more inertia small faults can be addressed with the inertia of the system itself while in case of renewable we will have different kind of challenge uh, with reduced inertia advanced metering and it ict infrastructure because when you have more smart meters deployed in the system you have uh, more information and communication technology requirement then you see a lot of microgrids are also coming so you see greater integration of renewables and storage at community level or maybe even at distribution system level energy storage in the form of grid connected as well as off grid that means flexible energy storage system say electric vehicle is also your uh, flexible energy storage system so those are also getting integrated into the distribution system which is again uh, impacting the performance of the distribution system because sudden addition of any electric vehicle into the system for charging will have impact on the performance of the distribution network then see different uh, reforms which have been initiated by government of india like apdrp rapdrp ipds schemes the india lopadhyay gram jyoti yojana virtual discount assurance yojana premium distribution sector scheme so all these initiatives are coming for the distribution system which have their own uh, targets in this revamp distribution sector scheme is the newest one because with this government is trying to modernize the distribution sector by adding more uh, sophisticated tools in the form of uh, adms advanced distribution management system and geographical information system gis better fault uh, addressing mechanism and so on so now the distribution networks are transforming themselves into active distribution network with bidirectional power flow so this bidirectional power flow is very important because you are now having more distributed energy sources in the distribution system so at lightly loaded condition you will see lot of power is pushed back to the distribution system by these renewable energy sources for that the distribution system is not designed traditionally so you need more sophisticated tools and techniques to address those challenges which are coming in the in the distribution system now if you talk about the definition of a smart grid so you need to just remember these four r's the system which is resilient reliable robust and reconfigurable you can consider that power system network as a smart grid so there are lot of definitions reported in the literature so one such definition given by james momo which says that a smart grid is an advanced power system network which is having two way digital as well as electrical power flow capable of self healing adaptive resilient and sustainable with foresight of prediction under different uncertainties it is equipped for interoperability with present and future standards of components devices and systems that are cyber secured against malicious attack so in this definition james momo has covered all important aspects in the power system network 
which are required to be built. Then NIST USA, that is National Institute of Standards and Technology, has given the definition which says that a modernized grid that enables bidirectional flow of energy and uses two-way communication and control capabilities that will lead to an array of new functionalities and applications. IEEE definition says that a smart grid is a large system of systems where each functional domain consists of three layers, power and energy layer, communication layer and IT computer layer. Then layers two and three, that is the communication layer and IT layer, are the enabling infrastructure that makes the existing power and energy infrastructure smarter. Let's see how we can uh, make the power transmission or distribution system smarter. So as I mentioned that in our traditional power system network, we have only, only unidirectional power flow that is from generation then to transmission using various step up and step down transformers we reach to the distribution network and then from distribution network to load ends so that is the traditional way of the power system uh, architecture what is changing the problem is happening because of wide geographical spread uh, of the power system network we are seeing lot of different load centers coming up, different conventional and non-conventional energy sources are coming up. So your size of the power system network is increasing. Lot, lot of interconnections are coming up. Rapid growth in demand of electricity is coming because of the heavy dependence on the electricity now. Power system components are now being operated closer to their design limits. And Penetration of renewable energy sources and competitive electricity market is forcing us to go for more sophisticated power system network. What transformation is happening? This is our traditional way of power system operation, generation to transmission, transmission to distribution, and then through distribution network, we have different kinds of loads maybe industry, commercial, or residential. What is happening now, because of the integration of different energy sources, like rooftop solar, wind farms, microgrids, electric vehicles, or in fact, energy storage or large scale renewable penetration, the distribution is now becoming bidirectional. Sometimes it is pushing power back to the distribution network and from distribution network to back the transmission network. And now this is a challenge because our system is not designed for uh, backward power flow. So we need proper protection, monitoring and observ observability uh, mechanism so that we can address these challenges which are happening in the system right now. So particularly the distribution system is uh, more challenging because it is seeing the large change in the distribution uh, system power flows. In fact, during daytime, it will be lightly loaded because of the solar penetration. We do not know the real load because most of the load will be compensated by the solar PV system. But suddenly in the evening, after 5.30 or 6 p.m., we see the sudden jump in the demand. And that demand is something which is very difficult to meet in real time because your generation will be ramped down because of the lightly loaded distribution network. It will need some time to ramp up. So real time balancing of the load and generation is very uh, challenging task in today's uh, power system network. Then what we need to do, we need proper ICT communication uh, backbone where each and every equipment and each and every appliance which is there in the power system network needs to be IT or ICT enabled where we can 
remotely communicate with those devices for control or data acquisition. So this is now the requirement in our power system network where a lot of uh, data we need to capture from end devices. What are the different building blocks we are seeing in the smart distribution system? First is the distribution automation. So we started our journey with distribution automation where small automation activities like in the form of relay operation, breaker automation, all those things happened. Then later we switched over to substation automation where we added intelligent electronic devices. We made the substation IC61850 enabled where every aspects of the uh, substation operation is automated and almost in real time the operation can be taken place with the help of substation automation. Then we saw the integration of advanced metering and communication technologies. In fact, in India, we are right now moving towards the 100% smart metering in uh, cities. Slowly, they will penetrate into the rural areas also because advanced metering infrastructure has its own advantages in the form of better monitoring of the load. In fact, you can remotely connect, disconnect the meter for those cases where you see that the energy theft is happening or the customer is not paying the bill. Then synchrophaser measurements, these started uh, its integration in the transmission system, but they are slowly uh, going into the distribution in the form of micro phaser measurement units and uh, it is enabling the wide area monitoring and control of the power system network then you need distributed intelligence because if you centralize the intelligence the decision making will be delayed so you need distributed intelligence in fact at in each and every device level you have some intelligence to be built so that the response of the system is quick and then you go for various software enterprise applications for better monitoring control operations and then evolution of various uh, IT applications or IT technologies like uh, IoT, data analytics and cloud computing. What are the, challenge, what are the differences between conventional and conventional grid and smart grid? So from architecture point of view, if you see the conventional power system network is hierarchical while your smart grid is uh, more unbundled and distributed in nature. When you talk about consumer participation, most of the time you will see that in conventional power system, the consumer is not non-participative and very less information is shared with the end consumer. In fact, only once in a month you will get the billing information and your load consumption information. While in the smart grid, we are uh, seeing that with the ad integration of advanced meeting infrastructure, you can even see your load profile in real time. Then generation and storage operations. Most of the time in conversion power system, generator are in dominance. Storage framework is not there. While in smart grid, we need distributed energy resources with plug and play features. So your dominance of the central generator has gone with the advent of smart grid technologies. Power quality. In conventional system, we have poor qual power quality. Focus is mostly on outage. Well, in the smart grid, we see power quality is the uh, priority. When we talk about new product and services, very limited or poor customer focus is there in the commercial system. In smart grid, we can have better market and services for customer. We can see the, uh, the energy meter portability similar to what we see in case of mobile number portability in near future because 
uh, if you are not happy with one service provider, you can switch over from uh, utility A to utility B. So this is what is already happening in uh, different parts of the world. In India, we are still not in a position to reach to that level, but soon we will see that uh, type of uh, energy uh, service providers coming in the distribution system. Then asset optimization is very poor. We have hardly any data related to the loading of the different devices like transformers in the conversion system, while in smart grid, we are seeing more data driven approach. In fact, predictive asset management or reliability centered maintenance will be key in the smart grid. Self healing is not enabled in conventional power system network, while in smart grid, you need self healing because your system should recover itself from any fault or any abnormal condition without any human intervention. Then cyber attack, you need smart grid to be resilient to cyber attack. So unlike conventional power system network, you need to build cyber security um, resiliency uh, applications in the power system network. Disaster management is very slow and reactive. While in smart grid, we uh, have more proactive and quick response to the disaster because when we have informed decision, our response will be faster. We already know that these uh, weather uh, websites show the uh, possible uh, adverse weather condition, maybe cyclone or uh, any other such kind of activity. If we can integrate that with our power system network, we can easily see that what are the equipment which are likely to get impacted. Based on that, you can take decision for quick restoration, which is not happening right now in our existing power system network. Since we do not have data, so we have very less event analysis possibility in the conventional power system network. While in smart grid, we forecast smart analytics with the uh, better load or generation forecasting capabilities. Communications, mostly one way communication happens in conventional while in smart grid, we are seeing the integrated two way communication. Predictive algorithms are not there in the conventional power system network while we need predictive uh, processes and applications in the smart grid because we need to predict well in advance before we see any possible collapse of the power system network, which is not there right now. And we need such kind of solutions to be built so that we can avoid any possible blackouts or brownouts in the system. Limited intelligence we see in the conventional system, while in smart grid, we'll have uh, more sophisticated intelligence and uh, we have the capability to process the critical information in real time. Poor efficiency is there in conventional while efficiency will be focused in smart grid. So these are the typical parameters through which you can judge uh, about the readiness of our power system network towards smart grid. Now, what are the different domains we have in uh, smart grid? So traditional domains are there like generation, transmission and distribution, but some other new domains are coming up in the uh, smart grid definition. One is better customer participation, operations, energy market and service providers. So if you see this figure, you will uh, come to know that lot of communication is happening between different domains. While actual power transmission is happening between these four domains only, right? So that's why we see that in future, when we 
switch over to completely smart distribution or transmission system we will see the value of bits more than the value of electron so in a smart grid we can say that the bits are or bytes are more valuable than the electrons customer domain if you see that uh, contains different kind of sub customer segments commercial industrial and home in these three domains you will see a lot of automated devices because you need more uh, data communication and information sharing so through different gateways like home gateway building gateway or industrial gateway you will share this information with various entities like service provider operations distribution and energy markets in market domain your more focus would be to get information uh, from different domains almost in real time because you need to take decision that uh, when and what amount of energy you want to trade in the market service provider this is the domain which is slightly new in the smart grid because once you have more penetration of different information and communication technologies and uh, more devices iot devices in the system or the more integration of renewable energy sources you need different kind of service providers out of these retailer and aggregator is uh, more common retailer means the uh, company which is taking care of your uh, energy bills requirement or any meter related activities or related to any power distribution uh, issues so retailer you can change like a mobile number portability you can change your retailer company aggregator means that entity which is in a position which is uh, having a capability to aggregate the different renewable energy sources and trade on behalf of you in the market so 5 kilowatt uh, renewable which you have on rooftop may not have that visibility in energy market but if 100 such customers this aggregator aggregates 500 kilowatt he can trade in the market so aggregator will aggregate the uh, the solar generation which is distributed and it will trade or negotiate with the distribution company for any possible economic benefit other than that you will have lot of other uh, service providers like uh, your technical services provider for solar for energy storage for your home appliances which are now being uh, iot enabled or home controller so lot of such kind of uh, service providers will come up in the uh, domain then operations means your real time operation maybe it is network operation or the maintenance or supply chain or any such kind of operation which is required for the effective monitoring and control of the power system generation traditionally it was more of a concentrated in thermal hydro kind of uh, generation but now in addition to your conventional uh, energy sources lot of renewable energy sources are coming in which pump hydro geothermal biomass hydro solar wind are uh, more common and because of that you are kind of distributing the generation domain across the uh, value chain whether it is transmission or distribution or even the consumer premise transmission domain is still our traditional transmission network where long distance uh, you see the power transmission from uh, concentrated load uh, from generation side to concentrated load side distribution system will see lot of changes because uh, in future you will see lot of uh, integration of renewable energy sources 
or any other such kind of distributed generation with energy storage. So you will have a lot of new energy resources coming up in the distribution system at distributed level. Because of all those things, you will see a lot of regulatory challenges and we are right now witnessing those problems and uh, what are those main challenges? First challenge is that although we are having a lot of uh, new renewable energy sources or the new technologies in the system, it is very hard to convince the utility companies that what are the benefits of these kind of solutions. Then energy efficiency is the benchmark for smart grid. But it is not necessary that once you get the energy efficiency, you will get economic efficiency as well. So most of the time, utilities are uh, concentrated towards economic efficiency than the energy efficiency. So telling them the benefit of energy efficiency is another challenge. Now, because of the huge intervention of different uh, IT and uh, communication technologies, we are seeing that the smart grid implementation is happening in phases. So it is very difficult to tell people about the advantages of overall smart grid technologies. Policies we need to create so that we can use the best of the uh, technologies which are uh, available as part of a smart grid. We need to develop some mechanism for different stakeholders so that they can uh, get some incentive in the uh, deployment of smart grid technologies or in the promotion of different demand response schemes. We need to encourage the system operator and utilities to pay more active role in addressing the future economic and technical and social challenges. Long-term clear-cut policy is required because uh, smart grid implementation requires a lot of policy intervention. Electric vehicle demand response and in fact renewable energy sources integration require uh, sophisticated policies which are still not there in the system. We are not in a position to handle huge amount of data. In fact, energy theft is not that big concern while data theft is becoming more concern for the utility companies. Other devices like uh, smart meter, phaser measurement unit or other is, uh, smart home solutions are generating lot of data. We are not having sophistic, sophisticated tool to handle those kind of data sets. So that's why data production is another issue. And then standardization in the smart grid is another challenge because different kind of devices having their own data standard or uh, the protocol standard. Seamless integration of data is a biggest challenge in the smart grid domain. What are the different agencies we see in a smart grid area? We have IEEE, as you may be knowing, then International Electrotechnical Commission, National Institute of Standards and Technology, SIGRE, UC, UCA IUG, that is Universal Communication Architecture International User Group, EPRI, NREL, ESA, NERC. These are the main agencies worldwide which are uh, responsible for the deployment of different smart grid technologies. In India, we have uh, India Smart Grid Forum, then India Smart Grid Task Force, which was initially created by government of India, but it was uh, diluted and then National Smart Grid Mission was created in January 2016. So it is, uh, a body which takes care of the different smart grid pilot project implementation in India. Then to some extent, CPRA is also uh, funding some of the smart grid uh, pilot projects. And then you see different utilities are also working on uh, different smart grid aspects. Now, 
particularly if we talk about the renewable integration we see that in future the role of conventional energy sources will reduce drastically because as per current target the renewable energy penetration will be almost 90% by 2050 so you can understand that how uh, the role of renewables is coming up in the market but it is also adding more challenges in the power system network what are the challenges so first biggest challenge is the intermittency because say solar is available during day time and then it is available only when we have the clear sky so the solar output depends upon season weather and other parameters which require accurate forecast so in addition to your uh, load or generation forecast you need accurate weather forecast as well so that you can get the real uh, picture about the renewable uh, generation in the distribution system so that intermittency is creating lot of challenges sudden cloud cover will ramp down your generation from uh, peak to zero in fact the problems are already coming uh, in the distribution system especially like in gujarat when we see where we have uh, huge solar power generation in the evening suddenly when we see the uh, the sunset the demand of around 5000 megawatt comes up suddenly so 5000 megawatt is not a small demand in the system and addressing that demand require lot of technology intervention then voltage and frequency control because most of the these sources do not have reactive power generation so uh, although new converters which are coming up in the market are having now the uh, converter control with reactive power generation but we have lot of such installation uh, in the solar in the distribution and transmission system where the solar generation happens with the help of the first generation or uh, the second generation of inverters where we do not have reactive power management capability so this again poses the challenge how you will control the voltage and frequency of this system then sudden generation loss leads to transient angle and voltage instability and that's why we need real time monitoring and control of these kind of uh, energy sources if we have the transient coming in the system we have only few seconds of time window to control the operation of the power system network and that kind of control is not possible with our conventional scada or adms system we need more sophisticated tools for uh, addressing the transient phenomena or voltage instability phenomena stability issue is more challenging because inertial as generation um, will reduce the overall inertia of the system as i mentioned that in conventional power system since thermal energy uh, thermal power plants have huge mass in terms of big generators so their inertia has the capability to absorb a small uh, size of faults and uh, the system doesn't get out of synchronism but once we have more uh, solar penetration which is not having any inertia will have more challenge in terms of transients in terms of faults and how we will address the stability issue in the system then power quality issue will also come because of uh, harmonics flickers and under voltage right through in the system then optimal power management you need 
new tools for uh, in terms of ADMS or microgrid energy management system, which can give you better visualization of the uh, such kind of renewable energy sources. Then adaptive operation is key because we have now bidirectional power flow. That means the conventional protection schemes are no longer working. You need uh, adaptive protection scheme where you can address the bidirectional power flow because right now the system is designed for unidirectional power flow. Once the power reversal, power flow reversal happens, system will consider it as a fault and relay will operate. But when we have more renewable energy, renewable energy penetration, the bidirectional power flow will be the common phenomena and we need to change our protection settings. So these are the challenges we saw in the renewables as of now. Let me discuss about one case study, or in fact, uh, this is a Indo-US project, which we have uh, executed in our uh, campus. There in India side, we have 15 organizations and uh, from US side, we have 15 organizations working on the development of next generation of a smart distribution system with the renewables and storage. There in US, we have five demonstration pilots and in India also we have five demonstration pilots. In India, we have three pilots which are being executed by IIT Kanpur. One is uh, urban pilot, then semi-urban and then rural pilot. One semi-urban is being executed by Netra NTPC and then uh, urban pilot, another one is being executed by Terry. So we, today I'll talk about the uh, three pilots which are being executed by IIT Kanpur. So that is rural, semi-urban and urban pilots. So rural pilot is being uh, commissioned in a village called Harnu, which is around 45 kilometers from campus. And Dakshiranchal uh, Vidyut Vitranigam, that is DVBNL, is the utility in Harnu village. So if you see the structure of uh, the pilot, we have two hamlets. One is Chabba Nevada, another is Bargadia Purva. These two hamlets are being fed from utility grid separately. So they have 49 kilowatt KVA of uh, utility grid connection. And then utility grid uh, is connected to our local control center. Here in this local control center, we have hybrid inverter where you have 100 kilowatt hour energy storage system. This is the lithium ion energy storage system, which is connected to hybrid inverter for providing the power supply. Then we have uh, in Bargadia Purva, we have 30 kilowatt of solar, which is connected to local distribution system uh, using grid tie inverter. We also have 30 kilowatt of hybrid biomass. So this particular uh, substation which we have created in the uh, Bargadia Purva has different energy sources and load is for the village as well as for the street lights. In this particular setup, we have microgrid controller which decides which source should be dispatched at what time depending upon the economics and the availability. So most of the time in daytime, uh, you will have first power to be dispersed from solar PV panels. And if there is an extra power, this uh, is uh, uh, exported back to the grid. In the evening time, first priority is given to biomass system. So evening 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, hybrid biomass system works. Once it exhausts, then we switch over to battery energy storage system. 
so this priority has been decided then another important feature is the uh, power flow between these two village hamlets so we have another 25 kilowatt ac dc ac converter where you can share power from one village to other village say for example if uh, one side utility grid is not available and load is more uh, than the generation so first it will uh, import power from another uh, hamlets provided it has sufficient generation so in that way you can exchange the power internally even if the grid on either side is not available in case of chabba nevada we have uh, 100 kilowatt hour of lithium ion battery energy storage system and 70 kilowatt of solar so in this particular rural microgrid the major challenges are how you will interconnect to uh, different microgrids in fact this is micro this is a one microgrid this is another microgrid and we are connecting them to uh, connecting them to each other via uh, customized ac dc ac converter which was designed by us and then later it was manufactured by a company called statcom so the important component is ac dc ac converter then microgrid controller and then operating philosophy based on what energy resource will be dispatched first so in that way you will see that in rural setting also the microgrid and uh, other renewable integration activities can be performed uh, with the help of uh, support from uh, local utility as well as from the local village people so these are the some uh, real pictures of the village this is our biomass plant where you will see that it is a digester then in the digester once the methane gas is generated this is a balloon which stores the methane gas the output of this uh, digester is the bio uh, fertilizer so liquid and solid fertilizer is uh, is used for uh, local irrigation activities this is our control room and uh, solar pv system in uh, bargadia purva hamlet and this is independent solar pump given to them for irrigation purpose now uh, this is a uh, control room at uh, chabba nevada where we have ground mounted solar pv system and these are some glimpses of our meetings which happens in the village then second pilot is uh, our smart grid semi urban field pilot so as per definition semi urban is that area where we have mostly single story houses scattered uh, in a large geography since we uh, we have the uh, faculty houses replicating to the semi urban setup where we have individual houses scattered around so we took campus uh, lane 32 and 33 for uh, implementing the semi urban uh, pilot so in this pilot we are having uh, 5 kilowatt peak rooftop solar in 30 houses we have two battery storage systems and at the end of both lanes in one lane we have 140 kilowatt hour lithium ion and another we have 100 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery storage system so we have distributed solar pv and concentrated battery storage the advantage of having this kind of setup is that as you know that when we have grid connected solar pv system once grid is not available your output from the uh, grid connected solar pv is also zero so to address that challenge we create uh, the local distribution ring with the help of uh, our 
battery storage system. So we will disconnect lane 32 and 33 from rest of the campus grid. We create local uh, island having uh, these two battery energy storage systems. So this hybrid inverter, if you see in this figure, this will be uh, acting as a grid forming inverter. And uh, this will give voltage reference to those rooftop solar PV systems. And uh, your solar power output will keep on coming to the local islanded grid. So the advantage of, uh, so the limitation of not having solar power output under outage condition is addressed with the help of uh, this kind of uh, islanded operation of the system. So this we realized over there. Then we have two EV charging stations also to uh, check the vehicle to grid and grid to vehicle capability. Though we have right now vehicle in the uh, campus which can only charge but cannot discharge. But in future, we are planning to modify the, uh, the vehicle and the development of bidirectional power converter so that the power from uh, vehicle can also be pumped back to the grid. Then these all are being monitored through our uh, local SCADA system that I'll show in next few slides. This is our architecture or single line diagram of our semi-urban pilots uh, where we have uh, different houses with solar PV. Then the substation which is feeding both of the lanes is connected to our scatter system for uh, monitoring of the important parameters of our semi-urban pilot. In urban pilots, uh basically this urban definition is the area where we have multi-story buildings so multi-story apartment of faculty members we have considered for implementation of urban field pilot where the main objective is to minimize the consumption of the diesel generator because we need diesel generator whenever there is a power outage Diesel generator used to run for common lighting and uh, the lifts. So we replace the diesel generator by solar PV setup as well as the battery energy storage system of 50 kilowatt hour. So in that case, for any power outage, we are not depending upon the diesel generator. While this particular setup will uh, support the lifts in the apartment and uh, the common lighting which are uh, required for that particular building. So these are the three pilots which we have uh, in the campus. In urban we also have the thermal energy storage system. So if you see this is our thermal energy storage system which has a capability of uh, 775 ton hour. So this particular tank contains the phase change material. So this phase change material is uh, cooled down to minus 8 degree centigrade and cooling is retained with this thermal insulated uh, tank. So whenever the air conditioning load is required, we rather than adding that load to the grid, we connect to this particular uh, thermal energy storage system and uh, uh, the air conditioning requirement is fulfilled by uh, this thermal energy storage system. So this has a main advantage that during peak load condition, generally this happens in peak summer during 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. So during that period, when we have peak load condition, we can cut off the air conditioning system from the grid and continue to pump air conditioning, uh, air, cool air from uh, the thermal energy storage system. This is our smart grid control center where we monitor all our pilots. And in fact, we have our own 
advanced metering infrastructure uh, applications developed and uh, deployed here where we can uh, monitor the smart meter data at very fast rate so we have uh, configured to share the data after every one minute but you can go up to 30 seconds as well then we are building our own advanced distribution management system this is very important because in future when we go for smart distribution system we need advanced distribution management system for better monitoring and control the conventional distribution management systems are developed uh, with uh, more legacy IT technologies and that's why those have a lot of limitations. This ADMS system we are building uh, with more flexibility and uh, we are using common information model for real-time data exchange between different software applications. So our complete database is built around common information model for better interoperability. And then in fact, topology processor, state estimator, distribution system power flow has been already implemented. We are right now implementing fault location, volt power optimization in this ADMS. Switch order management, loss minimization are some functions which we will complete by end of June. Geographical information system. For that, we have used OpenStreetMap, and that is being integrated with our ADMS system. So, in total, if you see our ADMS architecture, it is a next generation ADMS system which has more flexibility and better uh, integration of data and software applications. So with this, uh, thank you very much for listening to me. I'm open to questions so that uh, I can answer your queries. So now session is open for discussion. Please, if you have any query, you may ask. Anyone? Can you hear me, Rajesh? No one has any question? Sir? Someone? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm having one question, Nat. Um, so you, in the beginning of the slide, you have told um, from RTU to SLDC, then RLDC, and then to NLDC, there are some communication gaps or so time mm -hmm. loss of some time is done in terms of 10 seconds or 15 mm -hmm. seconds. So, so can you please elaborate um, what kind of time loss? Because if it is a, a time loss consists of one so communication or is the measurement and all in in the sending of data to from one server to another because nowadays we are having high bandwidth of communication like optical fiber and 4g and 5g then why such communication losses there see sldc and rldc are situated in different cities right you are relying only on the um, public service provider generally you use either mpls or maybe to some extent 3g and 4g uh, communication for data uh, sharing right now from rtu to sldc you have inherent delay because rtu is based on pooling of the data right so pooling means you have one server and if you have 100 rtus the server goes to each and every RTU and asks for the data. So that is the pooling mechanism which was developed traditionally because at that time we were having the limitation on the bandwidth of the system. So still we are following that kind of architecture which is uh, 
um, not um, basically um, good for uh, current uh, IT infrastructure. We need to go for more sophisticated uh, subscriber public publisher module. But since the SCADA system is a legacy system, it is still pulls the data. Once you start pulling the data, you have inherent delay of uh, five to ten, 10 seconds, right? Now, once you reach to server level, SCADA has its own processing limitation. It will take its own time to process the data. Even if you have very fast data communication, the software has itself uh, some delay, maybe two to three seconds of delay or uh, to some extent four or five seconds of delay for processing the data and further sending data to uh, another control center. So basically when you send data from SLDC to RLDC, you use a protocol called, called ICCP, that is Inter Control Center Communication Protocol. So what will happen from RTU, you have got data in 60870-5-104. So 104 protocol is the uh, default protocol you use for RTU to SCADA server data communication. Once you receive data at server, you kind of decrypt the data because you want to remove the protocol component and receive the data from that data packet. So it has its own delay. Then you process for possible outlier or missing data or uh, you replace with any calculated data. So then you have some more delay in that. Now from SCADA, you have to again pack that data into uh, ICCP protocol, right? So then again, you have some processing delay from ICCP sending end to receiving end, you have another communication delay, right? So delays are involved in each and every step. And because of that, you are having that kind of total delay, as I mentioned in the slide, right? So this is not because of your fast communication capability, which you have right now. It is because of the inherent processing limitations we have in the uh, different softwares. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Good evening, sir. Myself, Srikant. Uh, I am studying MTech in uh, NIT Agarthala. Sir, regarding IT and OT applications, you have said that OT, um, like uh, operation technology side, we should have some minimum idea regarding IT side. Like, what exactly knowledge should we have, sir, regarding IT side? So, for uh, from IT side, you should have the knowledge about um, how the data communication happens. So, in fact, uh, computer network knowledge is the uh, most important thing. Then you should have the knowledge about various software protocols we use in IT side or OT side, both sides. Say when we talk about TCP IP or when we talk about Ethernet, most of the people are not aware whether Ethernet is hardware or software, right? Or whether Ethernet is a protocol or a technology. So those kind of small things are creating uh, uh, limitations in our understanding. So in fact, understanding about the TCP IP, understanding about the OSI seven layer architecture, computer network, and the protocols which we use in the power system network are very much essential. Then when you talk about information technology, you should have the basic idea about object oriented programming, how you uh, do the programming, what is web service, how you create uh, API call, all those things are very much essential, uh, which we try to neglect because uh, uh, we do not have that kind of exposure in our uh, regular curriculum. Thank you, sir. Anyone? Okay, so I think 
right but i have a one query in this the, the case study uh, mm-hmm. related to rural area mm-hmm. you have connected two hamlets na yes right so uh, right now have you proposed any billing structure for that because you are connecting two microgrids so who uh, that connecting line is is matlab who belongs to that connecting line actually so basically if you are sending power from village a to b then a will bill to b and when b will send to a then b will bill to a so right then now who we is- have not done the commercial uh, calculation like who will bill but we are assuming that both will uh, need power so sometime in future it will automatically cancel out because uh, at say on day one someone is send village is sending power to b uh, for uh, say one hour second day b will send to a for again one hour so it will kind of cancel out okay so there is a the net will be zero net bill will be zero right okay thank you anyone else right dr vikram so yeah good evening sir good evening sir so, i have a small query actually in your uh, hamlet you have said that you are using ami mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. so is there any reason we are not using amr instead of ami other than two way communication system amr doesn't have a capability to remote disconnects the meter because it is only for meter reading amr so you can only use meter reading not the two way communication so it's a one way communication you will only read the meter data but sometimes you want to disconnect the meter remotely when uh, someone is not paying energy bill that is only possible when you deploy the ami infrastructure yeah so that is only for two way communication system yes yeah thank you sir so actually myself co coordinator for this hotel hotel rdp so i have seen the uh, presentation thoroughly mm-hmm. so the beginning of smart distribution grid mm-hmm. so you have nicely presented the seminar or the deliberations you have highlighted so many things starting from power system automation recent changes in power sector given the evolution of different it and ot systems how they are interrelated how they are not dependent on each other or interdependent so all these things are i hope has greatly helped the audience or the participants and i hope if there is any doubts that remains with the participants they may link up with you through the mails sure 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 so with this we comes to the end of today's sessions i thank you from the deep of my heart for being a part of this vp and uh, i thank you from the on behalf of nit agartala and electrical engineering department particularly as well as from the participants and the corporate coordinator and head of the department i thank you once again sir thank you for the deliberations thank you so dr vikram is the one of the coordinators of this program also okay he is good faculty man. now i request everyone please turn on your video so that we can capture one fake also